Hi everybody, my name is Dawn and welcome to What's the Stitch, a web series where I answer all of your burning questions about sewing, costuming, and cosplay. Today I want to talk about hoop skirts! These are a staple in both cosplay and historical costuming and I've worn a couple different variations for costumes in the past and while I love them for the aesthetic, they really were not the most convenient things to wear. One of the oldest variations of hoop skirt is the Spanish verdugado, which is the root of the English word farthingale. These were stiffened with hoops made from Spanish verdugo reeds, and they were introduced in the late 1490s. One of the earliest versions that we know of was worn by Joan of Portugal, who was a rebellious trendsetter. She was known for wearing gowns that exposed the décolleté, which was very scandalous at the time. She already had two illegitimate children by the Queen's steward, and the rumors were when she introduced hoop skirts that she was actually wearing them to disguise another pregnancy. At this time, the hoops were sewn into the skirts themselves rather than as a separate undergarment to be worn underneath the gown. The middle and lower classes created the hoops using thick cord and bands of fabric to create the fashionable silhouette without the restrictiveness of the reeds. The farthingale was introduced in England in the early 1500s by Catherine of Aragon, daughter of Isabella de Castillo and future wife of Henry VIII, though at the time she was actually intended to marry his older brother Arthur. Though royal women were often very influential in terms of fashion, the farthingale itself didn't actually catch on there until almost 40 years after she arrived at court. If we look to France in the 1570s, we see an introduction of a style called the wheel farthingale. This gave a cylindrical shape to the skirt with a wide hoop at waist and ankle height. It kind of looked like a barrel, actually. This was mostly a court garment. It later evolved in the 1590s to a style that got rid of the lower skirt completely, just jutting out from the waist with pleats and pieces of whalebone like spokes on a wheel. Some variation of farthingale remained in fashion until the 1620s, and not everyone liked them. There were a lot of complaints that they were comfortable, which I understand, they could be heavy and they totally got in the way, and James I of England was said to have hated them so much that he tried to ban them on two separate occasions. Farthingales fell out of favor at the end of the 17th century, replaced a couple decades later by a style called panniers. These resemble farthingales that have been squashed into an oval shape. They are named for a style of basket hung over the side of pack animals to carry goods. These were great for basket makers and coopers as they were constructed from interlaced sections of whalebone, austere, or metal that were tied together with cord and tape. These were very specialized constructions, so the cost was very high and was mostly restricted to the upper classes. Lower classes mostly made do with bum rolls, which were like an oblong crescent-shaped pillow that tied around the waist that have been used since the Elizabethan era to create a wider shape around the hips and emphasize the narrowness of the waist. Panniers continued to expand sideways until they got so wide that women actually had to turn sideways to get through doors because their skirts were over six feet wide. There were pamphlets declaring wearers of such wide skirts immoral, demanding what right they have to take up the room of six people. But of course, that was the entire point. Conspicuous consumption and increasing one's own consequence by taking up space. And if you're rich enough to wear such gigantic skirts that you can't fit through the door, it means that you are rich enough to have servants that you can send after whatever it is that you need. And that doesn't even touch the cost of the gowns themselves. For someone like Marie Antoinette, some of her gowns cost almost 20 times what a skilled worker would make in a year for each dress. You can understand how such excesses would have infuriated a population that was destitute and starving. So of course, the French Revolution spelled the end of panniers and large skirts for as a whole for half a century. Skirts in the early 1800s were very narrow, draping delicately from just under the bust and did not widen again until the 1820s. Over the next 20 years, women wore crinolines, which were linen or cotton underskirts that were stiffened with horsehair to create volume under their dress. By the mid-1850s, the skirts were getting so big again that layered petticoats were just becoming way too cumbersome to wear. We're talking about 20 pounds of fabric here, which is absolutely absurd. So steel cage crinolines were patented in April 1956 and soon were produced in volumes of tens of thousands every year. These were tied by tapes around the waist or sewn into the waistband of a petticoat as its own separate garment. These were made of whalebone, cane, and even inflatable rubber versions were introduced later, but steel hoops were the most common. The largest hoops of the late 1850s and early 1860s could reach a circumference of almost six yards. Cage skirts did offer a lot more freedom of movement than petticoats did, as they stood away from the body and allowed them to walk and move more freely, which was delightful when it came to hot weather. 
However, they did have disadvantages. You have to be very careful when sitting down so you don't flip your skirt. They did act as a buffer between a woman and an unwanted suitor, offering, unfortunately, just as much distance between them and a gentleman they actually wanted to court them. And despite the graceful bell sway that it gave when you moved, unfortunately, you had to move carefully because they often swayed enough that passersby got a view of ankle, which was, oh my goodness, just so scandalous. Only loose women displayed their ankles. And this is why regular low shoes were replaced by ankle covering and even up to knee-high boots. These giant skirts were worn by most classes, so there were a lot of incidents of women's skirts catching in machinery or brushing a hearth or candle flame and catching a light. There were some that suggested that women in domestic service forego fashionable hoops and save them for leisure time, and that resulted in a lot of displeasure from middle and lower class women who saw the suggestion as not only an effort to control their mode of dress and further underline class differences, but also would limit their basic freedoms. In response to this, many women refused to work for employers that would not allow them to wear their crinolines. This is the point where skirt sizes tended to get a little excessive. So in the late 1860s, hoop sizes started to decrease, shifting the volume towards the back of the gown. This is where we get something called a crinolette, which is kind of the missing link between the hoop skirt and a bustle. This was a series of half hoops that could be adjusted with ties to increase or decrease the fullness. A full skirt was considered vital to enhancing the smallness of one's waist, so draped fabric at the back of the skirt became more complex until they reached the tea cart style bustles that were common in the 1870s. These were supported by a smaller frame that rested on the bottom, known as a lobster pot for the resemblance to same. Crinolines and hoop skirts disappeared in the Edwardian era and resurfaced in the 1950s because thank you Dior and the new look campaign. Compared to frilled petticoats that were also common, hoops were sometimes seen as a better alternative as they would not flatten over time and they did not require starching or pressing. Uh, these were designed to follow a couple inches above the skirt's hemline because having a visible slip or crinoline was seen as a major faux pas. Today, hoop skirts are seen as more of a novelty item. They are used by brides to add volumes to skirts, for, for people doing historical reenactments, or cosplayers. Thank you for joining me today on my exploration of the history of the hoop skirt. If you liked it, please leave me a like below, and if you want to be notified when I upload another video, just ring that bell. If there are any other pieces of clothing or fashions that you would like the history of, just leave me a comment below and I'll be certain to feature them in a future video. Alright everyone, thank you for watching and I'll see you next week. Bye!